Okay, hello everybody and welcome to everyone who's joining us for the recording as well as everybody who's joining us right now in, in real time. Okay, so we're in chapter two, we're in section 2.1 and we're talking about the real numbers and their properties and also about other systems of numbers that we're used to dealing with. And since it's been a full week since our last meeting, let me just maybe try to recall a few of the things that we were talking about in section 2.1 last week. So this is section 2.1 of the lecture notes, basically, which is about the set of real numbers. So uh, just to recall that I suppose the notation and the kind of main points that we highlighted last week, we were looking at the different number systems that are familiar to us that live within the real number line. And the first one is the system of integers. And really part of the reason for recalling this is just to recall the, the various different notational elements that are used to denote these various systems. So the integers are denoted by this kind of boldface Z. And the integers is the set of all whole numbers, positive and negative and zero. So it's got zero, one, two, three, all the positive whole numbers. The positive whole numbers themselves are referred to as the natural numbers, which are used for counting, obviously. That's, that's, that's the system of integers. And you know, I guess we, they're sort of the first numbers basically that we encounter and that we learn to do calculations with, particularly the positive ones. But, and the appearance of the system of integers on the number line is basically as a bunch of evenly spaced points. So we've got zero, which is somehow kind of in the middle, even though the whole thing extends infinitely both ways. So you can't really talk about the, the middle. But we've got zero, one, two, three, minus one, minus two, and so on. And it just continues like that, conceptually, sort of infinitely in both directions. And you know, the, the spacing between consecutive pairs of integers is the same everywhere. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a it's, so the integers are evenly spaced. And they form what I'm going to refer to as a sparse set, although I'm not going to give a precise definition of that. It's the space between them. They're not, they're not all packed in together. Okay, so and they, of course that maybe makes more sense when we contrast them with the rational numbers. So the rational numbers are denoted by Q. And rational numbers are closely related to integers because they're sort of assembled from integers in a very uh, direct way. Q is a set of all numbers that one can obtain as a fraction where the numerator and denominator are both integers and the denominator obviously is not a, is not zero. So this rational numbers consist of all numbers that can be expressed as fractions involving integers. And this is in practical terms, really the number system that we use all the time in sort of everyday life, as well as in scientific applications, when you actually want to do calculations and you want to sort of estimate things and you want to measure things. Essentially you're using rational numbers, typically you're using decimals truncated at some point, and those represent rational numbers. So rational numbers are, you know, incredibly useful for measuring anything that can be quantified. And they're basically the numbers that we use when we're measuring, when we're dealing with data, when we're measuring basically anything that can be measured, but they still don't account for all numbers that we are interested in. And that's sort of the theme of these sections. So the appearance of the rational numbers on the number line uh, is that they are, so again, we've got the same basic picture of the number line. I'll, 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 I'll draw in sort of a few points to represent integers again in red. So there they are, evenly spaced, zero, one, two, and so on. And then I'll, I'll, I'll put the rational numbers that aren't integers in a different color. Although of course, every integer is a rational number, but there are rational numbers that aren't integers, such as one half, three over two, and so on. Here's seven over four. Here's 15 over eight, and so on. So there's loads of them. And so far I've only written in a few that have kind of powers of two as their denominators, but one can sort of write in, of course, loads more. Here's one third, for instance. Here's two thirds. And you know, you can, you can, you can, you can keep playing this game, of course. You can keep playing this and you, you, if you uh, don't give yourself some rules for ending this, you'll never stop. So, so, that's, that, that, so that's sort of a picture of the rational numbers. And I guess the point here is, you know, the rational numbers, no matter how many of them you draw in any particular restricted piece of the line. So here's one ninth, for example. Here's 1 27th, if we're going to talk about powers of three as denominators, whatever, you can keep going. You can put one over 81 in there between zero and one over 27. So the rational numbers, which are a few of them are indicated there in that pink color, the rational numbers are densely packed, or they're, they're tightly packed, they're densely packed into the number line.
and all of those pink points are supposed to kind of indicate that to us. And I suppose another way to think about it is, you know, between any pair of rational numbers, no matter how close together they are, there are infinitely many more rational numbers in between them. And you can just sort of scale up the denominators and write, write in this specifically if you want to, as many more in between the two that you started with as you would like. So for example, if you want to write in more rational numbers in between zero and one over 27, no problem, just write in one over 81, one over 100, one over 10,000. There's no shortage, there's no, uh, there's, you know, there's, you, you'll never run out of extra things that you can pack in there, no matter how small the interval is that you're trying to pack them into. So the geometry of the rational numbers, which is all those pink points all densely packed together, looks completely different from the geometry of the, the integers, which is this evenly spaced collection of points. And maybe a useful kind of thought experiment to think about is, you know, if you were to imagine all the rational numbers being colored in, with this pink color or whatever, and if you were to imagine kind of zooming in more and more on some little piece of the number line and just taking some little piece of that and zooming in more and more, continuing that, the appearance of the collection of points representing the rational numbers would never change. It would look the same, like at every degree of magnification. That's not true of the integers, where if you were to zoom in, for example, on some region, like let's say you start looking at sort of some wide section of a number line and you kind of zoom in on this region between whatever, between minus a half and one and a half or something like that, you know, eventually you see only two points. If you zoom in even more on some little tiny interval like that, you'd eventually see no points at all. So the integers, you know, they're, 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 they have to, they're, they're evenly spaced out. There's a clear separation between every integer and the next one. And so, you know, they don't, the, 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 the set of points representing the integers doesn't look the same at every level of magnification. Eventually, if you zoom in on some tiny region between two integers, you won't see any integers at all. With the rational numbers, you'll see infinitely many of them, no matter how closely in, no matter how close you zoom in, and no matter what, how, how short an interval you're looking at. So yeah, so they have very uh, different sort of appearance as collections of points. And I suppose, um, you know, the, the rational numbers also kind of arithmetically or <laughs> algebraically have very different properties from the integers. And that's one of the things that makes them kind of so useful for, for practical purposes, that if we, you know, if, if, you want to, if, you, if you want to represent physical quantities, even things that you can't maybe kind of measure with absolute precision, you know, things like the features of, you know, measures of, measures of weather rainfall today or temperature today or whatever it is or anything at all to do with observations in the physical world, you can use rational numbers to do it. And no matter what level of accuracy you want to record your details in, you can, you know, you, 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 can, you, you can find a rational number that represents your quantity as closely as you could possibly want. That's certainly not true for the integers. I mean, if you're, if you're, if the number you want to represent is something like 2.3141, whatever, and you want to represent it with an integer, two is as close as you can get. And you, there's no, you know, you can't choose a better integer than that. So the fact that the rational numbers are kind of densely packed into the number line means that every real number is as closely approximated as you possibly could want by rational numbers, something that's just not true for the integers. So yeah, so yeah they have completely different properties. And you know, people, of course, study all kinds of features of both of these number systems, uh, not all of which are we, we have scope for in this course or, or, or are a topic of attention in this course. But one of the things we might ask ourselves is, you know, these are two infinite sets, a set of integers and a set of rational numbers. Is there some sensible way that we can ask the question, is one of these sets bigger than the other? Or do they have the same size in some way? Does one of them have more elements than the other? And of course, you could say, well, there are more rational numbers than integers because look at all the, you know, look at all the examples of rational numbers that aren't integers. Because you can approximate anything as closely as you want to with a rational number, but not with an integer. And that is certainly true. But if you want to ask yourself which of these sets actually has more elements, that's kind of a, a harder question to get your hands on and, 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 and uh, maybe hard to articulate even what it means at this point. But that's something that we're going to look at and we're going to find out and we're going to look at this for, for various different infinite sets and figure out a way of kind of assessing the relative sizes of different infinite sets based on somehow the numbers of elements that they have, although those are infinite and not strictly numbers. So that's the that's kind of the goal. Uh, that's what we're working towards really today and also mainly next week. Okay, so that's sort of where we're at, I think. Uh, recall if you, the, the, the uh, notation Z and Q for the integers and rational numbers. Does anybody have a question or a comment at this point? Feel free to put one into the chat or to uh, turn on the microphone if you want to. OK, 
if not, then let's let's, let's move on. Uh, we're in section 2.1 of the lecture notes or the slides, and we're kind of in the middle of it. So I've, I've uh, added in a bit of what was part of last week's slides into this file. Okay, so we're, we're supposed to be talking about the real numbers. So far, we spent like nearly a full lecture or more talking about the integers and the rational numbers. So suppose now that we give ourselves back the old number line. So here it is again. And we're supposed to say integers are marked there obviously in order from left to right, like they're, they're evenly spaced dots and we suppose that all the rational numbers are marked as well. So there are like there are loads and loads and loads of marks corresponding to rational numbers. And so at this point, like lots of dots have been marked and all the, every little part of the line is filled up with marks representing rational numbers. But the assertion is, and okay, you shouldn't really believe this until we, until we uh, justify it, that there are lots of points on the line that still aren't marked, even though all the rational numbers are marked and there's like, densely packed together and so on. The claim is that after marking all the rational numbers, there are still loads of points that aren't marked. Okay, how are we going to justify that claim? Well, for example, I claim that the point, that there's a point that represents the real number square root of two that isn't marked, and that that's somewhere between the rational number 1.4142. Okay, that's certainly a rational number because it's 14,142 over 10,000. That's a fractional representation of it. Somewhere between that rational number and the rational number 1.4143, which is a different one, is an unmarked point that represents the real number square root of two. Okay, so you could ask lots of things about this. So one question you might ask is, well, how do we know that the square root of two is a real number if it doesn't have a fractional representation as integers? And this is indeed a philosophical question that occupied the minds of many people in the days of Pythagoras and around that time, um, to which, but, but, but it's one to which we can give an answer. And the assertion here is the set of real numbers is the set of all points on the line, whether they've been marked as rational numbers or not. So I suppose the, the answer to the claim about why we would consider the square root of two to be a real number, if we can't represent it as a fraction, which we haven't justified yet, would, be, would, would come really from the theorem of Pythagoras. So in the time of Pythagoras, geometers believed, you know, that numbers could be represented by fractions. And that was kind of how people dealt with numbers. But Pythagoras was able to show that one can construct a right angle triangle with two sides of length one, one unit, whatever unit you were using. And that if you did that, certainly, you know, we, we, we could construct lines of length one and we could construct right angles. And if you did that, then the length of the third side was a number whose square was one squared plus one squared. So it was a number which we would now denote by the square root of two, but you know, some, some number satisfying that property that its square is equal to two. And so this kind of presented a philosophical conundrum because as well as a mathematical one, I suppose, because the, you know, it was the, the system of numbers that was used and that was believed to kind of cover everything that you could want to do calculations with was the system of rational numbers. The, the people at that time had developed a system of, of, of calculation with rational numbers, which is the same as ours. And here they were able to, but also, you know, it was considered that anything that could be the distance between two points on some physical object that you could construct should be a number and should be a number that we can deal with. So it was kind of news to discover that one could construct this physical object, one could sort of realize it on, you know, in, in, in physical space on the ground or with a physical object or whatever. And you could have this kind of visible physical line segment a pair of points and the distance between them was something that didn't fit into the existing number system because it had square two and it was known that there was no fraction no kind of existing number that would have that property so this kind of geometric um understanding that came with the theorem of pythagoras kind of necessitated a, some, some sort of rethinking of what, what 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 we need to include what we need to consider as a number so the claim is that the square root of two is not a rational number that there's no way to write it as the as a fraction involving a pair of integers. And the same is true for the square root of any other, of, of, of any uh, prime number. And any num uh, and, yeah, and, and lots of other integers as well, of course. But um, assertion is not all real numbers are rational. So, okay, so I suppose that the, the assertion that the square root of two, for example, is a real number comes from the fact that it's the side length of a triangle that we can construct and, and the theorem of Pythagoras. Okay, so it should be a real number for that reason. And the claim is it's not rational because there's no rational number whose square is equal to two. So, I've used the example of the square root of three instead of the square root of two, but indeed the square root of three is also a constructible or, a, a, or it's also a, a number because if you have a, you know, if you, if you, uh, 
believe from the previous example that the square root of two should be admissible as a number, but then if you make a triangle with one side of length one and another side perpendicular to that one of length square root of two, which is a constructible number from the previous one, and then the third side of that triangle would have length whose square would have to be one squared plus square root of two squared, so it would have to be three. So the length of the third side would have to be the square root of three. So that would also have to be a, you know, a number that we'd be able to deal with. Okay, so we're gonna prove that the square root of three is not a rational number. And the exact same proof would apply to the square root of five or the square root of seven or the square root of any other prime. Okay, so, and, if, and to do this, of course, we're gonna use our knowledge about factorization of, of integers and some a bit of number theory, really. This is not really particularly close to calculus, but it's relevant to our study of, of real numbers. Okay, so we're gonna prove that the square root of three is not a rational number. Okay, this is a proof that's worth spending a bit of time thinking about if you haven't thought about it before. And what we're gonna to do to prove that is start with the assumption that we do have a fractional integer fractional representation of the square root of three and work towards a contradiction. Okay, so we're gonna show that if we did have that, if we did have such a, a, a fraction, we'd be able to get a contradiction to our knowledge about integers and how they behave under multiplication. Okay, so suppose that the square root of three is in fact rational. Okay, what that means is that it can be written as a fraction with an integer as the numerator and an integer as the denominator. Okay, so suppose we had such a fractional representation, then there's one step here, which is kind of a technical one, but it's worth giving some attention to. If we have such a fractional representation of the square root of three, and if there are any common factors in the numerator and the denominator, we could cancel them off and end up with a fractional representation where there are no common factors between the numerator and denominator. So if the square root of three is a rational number, then we can write it as m over n, where m and n are int positive integers with no common integer factors. In other words, we've canceled off any common integer factors that were present in the first version, and we've, and we've written down a version that doesn't have any. And you can certainly do that with any fraction. You can reduce it to simplest terms by canceling off any common factors. Okay, that's going to be important at the end because that's going to be how we get a contradiction. Okay, so, so setup now is we're living in a world where the square root of three is equal to m over n, where m and n are integers with no common factors between them. Okay, fine. Well, the square root of three at the moment is not really a, a you know, it's, it's basically a sort of symbol for this hypothetical number whose square is three. So if we square both sides of that equation, we'll, be, we'll have numbers in it that we kind of are familiar with and know how to work with. So squaring both sides here, we get that three is equal to m squared over n squared. And just rearranging that so that it's an equation in, involving only integers and not any fractions, we can say that it, it would be saying that m squared is equal to three n squared. Okay, so remember that m and n here are integers. Okay. So, okay, what's that saying? That's saying that m squared is a multiple of three. So m is an integer, m squared is a multiple of three. So the claim here is that that means that m must be a multiple of three. And I suppose the way to think about this, if it's not immediately clear, is, you know, m is, m is an integer. So it's some product of primes, maybe it's p1, p2, up to p, whatever. But these are primes. Okay, and m squared then, so I mean, m, m could be positive or negative, but it's, it's, maybe there's a negative sign in front of it, but the product of primes, maybe that sign. So if that's true, then m squared would just be p1 squared, p2 squared, up as far as pk squared. These p's are not necessarily different, but um, the square of m has the same primes in it that m has, except that each one appears twice as many times as it does in m. So the claim here is that if m squared is a multiple of three, then m must be a multiple of three as well. And the reason for that basically is you know, three is a prime number. If three doesn't already appear as a factor of m, there's no way that it can turn up an m squared as a factor. You know, think, of, think of numbers that are multiples of three, like six, six squared is 36. Okay, it's got a factor of three, but if you take something like, you know, um, 16, which is not a multiple of three. 16 squared doesn't have any three in it as factors either. And so the only way that three can appear as a factor of m squared is if it was already a factor of m. Okay, if you don't agree with that, just feel, feel, put, put a comment in the chat or, uh, or ask about it. Okay, so if m squared is a multiple of three, m is an integer, three appears in the prime factorization of m squared, so it must have already been there in the prime factorization of m. So that tells us that m itself is a multiple of three, Okay, which means that m squared must be a multiple of nine, 
And again, if you're doubting about that, think about examples, you know. So think about numbers that are multiples of three, like 15. 15 is three times five. 15 squared is three squared times five squared. It's got a nine in it, not just a three. Okay, because it has to have three twice if it has three once, because it's a square. Okay, so m squared then must actually be a multiple of nine, which means that m squared is nine times something, nine times some integer k. Okay, this might look like it's going around in circles, but it's, 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 it is going to come to a conclusion. Okay, so we're saying that m squared is three n squared. That means that m squared is a multiple of three because three is prime and m is an integer. That means that m squared, m itself must be a multiple of three. So m squared must be a multiple of nine. So it's nine times some k. So nine k then is three n squared. And we can cancel the three off that and we get that n squared is three k, which is saying that now n squared is a multiple of three, n is an integer, three is a prime factor of its square, so it must be a prime factor of itself. So n squared then is a multiple of three, and that's saying, well, n then must be a multiple of three. But now we're saying that both m and n are multiples of three, which contradicts our starting position, that m over n was a fractional expression for the square root of three in sort of lowest terms, where there were no common factors between the m and the n. Okay, so basically what we're saying here is that if m over n has the property that its square is equal to three, then three must be a divisor of both m and n, which can't be right because if square root of three has a fractional representation at all, it must have one where there are, you know, with, with, with least terms where there are no common factors to the numerator and denominator. Okay, so what we've shown is that there's no fractional representation of the square root of three in the form m over n, where m and n have no common factors. And that means well, there's no fractional approximation, no fractional representation at all, because if there was one, there'd be one in these terms. Okay, so this is, a, this is a very sort of standard proof. You almost always see it quoted for the square root of two, so just for a change, I did it here for the square root of three, uh, to show that, th that these, these, these square roots of, of, of primes are, are not rational numbers. Okay, they don't have, they're very nice numbers in, some, in many ways, because they satisfy very nice equations, like x squared minus three equals zero, but they're not rational. They don't have, their, their decimal approximation, their decimal representations don't terminate and don't repeat. They have a kind of infinite sequence of digits that, that doesn't have a, a discernible repeating pattern. So, so this is a, this is a, a proof I think that it's, it's, it's kind of worth coming back to and spending some time on. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a proof that turns up all over the place in number theory as well as in this sort of topic of, of looking at real and rational numbers. Okay, anybody have a comment or question about that? Okay, I suppose the point of it for now is just to point out that not all real numbers are rational. So when we make that assertion, we can back it up somehow by saying, well, here's an example of a real number that isn't rational. It's definitely a real number because like the square root of two, you know, it can be realized as a, as a side length in a right angle triangle in Euclidean space. So it's a number that we'd like to, you know, kind of it qualifies to be a real number. It represents a point on the number line, but it doesn't have a rational representation. It's stuck in here between, or the well, Square root of two is stuck between 1.4142 and 1.4143. Okay, and it's not, it's not rational. So, okay, so what are we saying? We're saying that as well as the rational numbers, which have this kind of, all these pink points on the number line that are densely packed in, as well as them, we have all these irrational numbers. And I think, you know, uh, when you see, when you're, when you're studying this kind of stuff and, you, and you're talking about irrational numbers, the examples that are always kind of cited as examples of irrational numbers are square root of two, Everyone likes that one because it's, 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 it's nice because it's the side length of this really nice right angle triangle, which is isosceles. Uh, pi is always cited as an example of an irrational number. It takes a lot bit more effort to show that pi is irrational and we're, we're not going to do it, but that's a harder job than showing that the square root of two where the square root of three is irrational. E is another one, which is an irrational number. Um, so by, because, because the same few examples are always kind of cited, you could kind of get the impression that irrational numbers are special and rare, that they're, you know, it's only these things. But that's actually like that, that's completely untrue. Like, you know, I suppose another way to think about this is, you know, if the square root of two is irrational, that's something like three plus the square root of two is irrational too. But nobody's going to kind of think of that as their first example of an irrational number. So, you know, um, once, as soon as you know that the square root of two is irrational, so you can sort of add any rational number you like to it and you have another irrational number. So you've kind of got a whole sort of copy of the rational numbers that you get by adding every rational number to the square root of two, and those things are all irrational. So there's loads and loads and loads of irrational numbers. There's a, you know, they're, 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 they're formed just as kind of dense, a, 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 a collection of points in the real number line, at least as dense as the rational numbers do. But 
you kind of tend to only cite a few examples of them all the time, so you could get the impression that they're kind of rare, but they're not. They're, they're, they're all over the place. Okay. So, in a very fact, in a very precise way that we'll see later, the irrational numbers are actually more plentiful than the rational numbers are. And that's not supposed to be obvious at all at the moment. And it's not even supposed to be obvious really what it means because we're dealing with these infinite sets of numbers, but that's kind of what we're aiming at. And you know what that's kind of saying is when you color in all the rational points in pink and they, they fill up all this like dense, they densely fill up the line, they, you know, they're densely packed in there. Every little interval is full of them. But even when you do that, the points that you haven't colored, which represent the irrational numbers, are even more densely packed in than the points that represent rational numbers. And we'll be able to kind of say what we mean by that in a fairly uh, precise way, I hope, next week. But that, that's, that's what we're aiming at. And so I think a kind of a, a, nice, a nice kind of exercise maybe to try out is to, to, you know, this isn't like the integration stuff that we were doing for the first few weeks where you can try out 10 examples of every technique. This is all a bit more nebulous. But something that you can do to give yourself a, you know, a, a, a kind of concrete task if you find it helpful, is to kind of you know, write down five irrational numbers between 20 and 21, or between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, or whatever, in some interval that you might want to look at, and um, you know, satisfy yourself that there are loads and loads and loads of them around. So for example, if you take the square root of 2, like that's between wherever, whatever it was, 1 point, it's between 1.4 and 1.5, let's just say that. And you know, if you wanted something between 0 0.14 and 0 0.15, take the square root of 2 over 10, that's going to be irrational as well. You can make adjustments to all these things. And produce more examples of irrational numbers or whatever you want to do. Okay, so um, here's a and here's another kind of exercise along similar lines, which I'm but I'm going to fire up a little poll here because I've been talking a lot. So a lot of the lines in this slide. Here's a here's a poll for you to think about. I just get you know it's a it's a it's a it's a little multiple choice thing. You don't have to think about it in great detail, but if you like to, just give an answer. I've got feeling if you want. Or think about it for a minute if you want to each of these. Some of these statements are true and some of them are not true. And they're, I think they are worth thinking about to get a sense of what's going on here with rational and irrational numbers. So I'll leave it open for a minute or two and uh, let everyone have a, a shot at it. I'll pause the recording while I'm doing this, just so that people watching the recording won't have to watch nothing for a few minutes. There we go. Okay, so uh, yeah, so these are just, you know, they're just, they're just a few kind of questions to, to help us think about how rational numbers and irrational numbers sort of relate to each other and how they behave. So hold on, I'll just share the outcome here of this, this vote. So yeah, so the sum of two rational numbers is, all, is also is rational. That is true. Yeah, and most of us would suggest that. So yeah, if you take two numbers that are fractions involving integers and add them together, you certainly still will have a fraction involving integers. So the rational numbers have this property that if we sort of stay, if we, if we, if we, if we take two numbers within that set and add them together, we still say stay within that set. And that's a property that's of interest to algebraists. You'd say that the, the rational numbers have a, form an algebraic structure under addition, because when you start within that set and apply addition, you, you stay within that set. You don't move outside it. Second one, the sum of two irrational numbers is always irrational. So that got a strong vote as well. And it is definitely likely that if you pick two random irrational numbers, their sum will be irrational. But it's not always true. Because for example, if you take something like pi, and two minus pi, those two numbers are both irrational. But when you add them together, you get two, which is certainly rational. So it can happen that the, you know, that you can have two numbers that are both irrational, but when you add them together, somehow they have kind of an irrational part that cancels and you're left with a, with a number which is rational. So it is possible for the sum of two irrational numbers to be rational. And in that sense, the irrational numbers don't really form a number system in the way that the rational numbers do, because when you add together two irrational numbers, it's not necessarily true that you stay within the set of irrational numbers. Okay, so some of a rational number and an irrational might be rational. That got a much lower vote, 23%. Um, that is not true. If you take a rational number plus an irrational number, you'll always get an irrational number. Okay, and I guess a way to say that, a way to see that maybe is, you know, if, you if, if it was possible to take a rational number plus an irrational number, and get a rational, then you could just subtract and you'd, you'd get a rational expression for the number that was supposed to be irrational to begin with. So that, yeah, so I, I, uh, I agree with the 77% of us who voted no to that. Okay, the product of two irrational numbers might be irrational. That is true, yeah. If you take, for example, the square root of two and the square root of three, multiply them together, you get the square root of six, which is still irrational. And you can prove that using a similar kind of argument to what we did for the square root of three. 
It's, it's also true, for example, that you know pi squared is irrational as well as pi being irrational. That's the next one. The product of two irrational numbers might be rational. Yes, that is also true, because if you multiply, for example, the square root of two by itself, you get two, and that is rational, even though the square root of two is not rational. So it is true that the product of two irrational numbers might be either rational or irrational. So the last two are both true. And, uh, the majority of you in these both cases also was that they're true. So I suppose I've just mentioned this because I think these are these are the kinds of questions that are worth thinking about when you're thinking about rational and irrational numbers and how they behave and how they, you know, how and the sort of the sort of life that they have arithmetically. What happens when you multiply them together, when you add them together? Can you say anything about what you expect about what, what you expect? And the answer is well, sometimes yes and sometimes no. So uh thanks very much for participating in that poll. I'm gonna Stop sharing the results of it now, and just go just go back to the slide where and these these, these questions, these you know suggested sort of questions to think about, are all in the lecture notes as well. So I suppose you know by way when you're studying this topic, like it's different from the from the integration topic where you can go to a textbook or to the lecture notes and work through a bunch of examples. This is a bit different. We're thinking about sort of conceptual things, but these are kinds of questions that might help to pin it down a bit. You know, think about these questions. You know, or ask yourself if you're if you're looking at these questions. You know, I've got a pair of Irrational numbers, maybe. Can I can I find an example of a pair of irrational numbers whose product is rational, or whose product is irrational, or whose whatever? You know, all the, all the, all, all these uh, sorts of questions are, are worth asking yourself and, and thinking about a little bit. And you know, if you find it helpful to write down examples to persuade yourself of what the answers are to these questions, I think that's probably a very a very good thing to do. So yeah, it's just a, a suggested way of thinking about these topics. Okay, this is kind of the conclusion of this first section of chapter two. So I suppose I, the kind of um, Last point is to, to include, I think there are many ways of thinking about a set of real numbers, and there are many people who devote their life's energy to thinking about these things. But two ways of thinking about them, which I find useful, are first of all, what I'm referring to as a kind of arithmetic description, meaning kind of as, as numbers, as opposed to a sort of geometric object or something like that. So we can think of the set of real numbers as all decimal representations of numbers. Okay, but that, I mean that by, I call it that arithmetic because the things, that the, the things you're thinking of are sort of lists of digits. Okay, so this description I think is conceptually quite valuable, but maybe not of much practical use. The reason being that if you have something like the square root of two and you want to represent it as a decimal, well, you can't actually write down the decimal expansion because it's endless and it's, it's not repeated. So, you know, you actually can't sort of do anything in practical terms with a decimal representation of the square root of two, but you can think about it. Okay, and you can think about the fact that a decimal representation has a, a non-repeating, non-terminating uh, form, and that's so. So it's 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 a way of thinking conceptually about real numbers, and so within the whole sort of universe of decimal representations. So a decimal representation is a string of digits with a decimal point somewhere in it, and the digits all between zero and nine. I mean, of course, you could do it in a different number base if you wanted to. But let's do it in the decimal system. So, um, and so every such thing is a is a real number. Amongst the universe of all such things, you have the ones that end in a string of zeros. And the ones that end in a repeating string that repeats ad, repeats ad infinitum, and those ones are the rational numbers. So, and, and, but you also have all these irrational ones that have haphazard, non-terminating, non-repeating decimal representations. Okay, so I suppose the remark is, you know, the ones amongst all the universe of all these decimal representations, the ones that have a terminating pattern ending in this infinite string of zeros or have a repeating pattern are kind of special and rare, and those are the ones that represent the rational numbers. So in that view, I think, I suppose one of the reasons I think it's kind of useful is you kind of, you can sort of think about how within all these, within this huge sort of range of things, yeah, the rational numbers are sort of, they're, they're special and rare. If you, pick, if you pick out one of these things that's completely at random, you don't really expect it to be rational. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, the ones that have all zeros after the decimal point are like incredibly rare. Those are the integers. Okay, so that's one view. And the other view is what I'm referring to as a kind of geometric description. The set of real numbers instead of all points in the number line. But the, okay, so every point on the number line represents a different real number. So it's this, it's this sort of continuous thing. It's full up of points. There are no gaps in it and no points that don't correspond to real numbers. Amongst all those points, some of them are rational, some are not, but every one of them is a real number. So I suppose the last kind of note then is just to recall, I suppose the thing that we really need from this section, apart from all these concepts, is we need to be able to recognize the symbols Z, Q, and R, and be able to kind of recognize them quickly without having to look them up each time for Z for integers, Q for rational numbers, and R for real numbers. So we need to be able to kind of incorporate those into our working and, and written sort of vocabulary. Okay, so section 2.1, uh, 
the learning outcomes are short. Um, just basically what we need to do is just be able to kind of think about the properties and elements of these three sets, integers, rational numbers, and real numbers, and sort of think about how they appear on the number line and point out, I suppose, a few important differences between them. Okay, but we're building up really on a, in, a, in a discussion towards some, some other things. Okay, section 2.2 is about subsets of the real numbers. Does anybody have a comment or a question at this stage? Okay, so in section 2.2, we're going to talk about finite and infinite sets a little bit, although really we're going to be talking more about infinite sets next week. So um, I suppose, again, here, there's a bit of notational detail to pay attention to that can easily trip us up if we're not careful about it. And apart from that, a lot of the things I think in this section are probably already familiar to everyone. In fact, you're probably going to be wondering, why am I making such a song and dance about things that are really sort of obvious and overcomplicating things that weren't complicated in the first place? And I certainly would be doing that. But the reason is because we want to take these things that are familiar to us when we're talking about finite sets and use them to basically explore the concept of infinity, which was a big breakthrough at the end of the 19th century in the history of mathematics. And that's what our theme is going to be. So, um, yeah, we're going to be talking about things in this section that are that weren't complicated until I started to make them complicated, but we're going to see the reason for that in the next section, I hope. Okay, so first of all, finite and infinite sets. So I guess we know what these terms mean uh, in in because they're used in, in everyday life as well as in mathematics, but a set is finite if it's possible to list its distinct elements one by one and that, and that this comes to an end. So the set of people at this meeting right now is a finite set. Okay. The, set, the set of students in the university is a finite set. The set of people registered in this course is a finite set set of integers between one and 10 is a finite set, but the set of rational numbers between one and 10 is not a finite set because there's infinitely many of those, okay? So a set is infinite if any attempt at listing its distinct elements one by one continues indefinitely, okay? So that's, a, that's the distinction between finite and infinite sets. And I suppose one of the things here, there's a bunch of examples coming up. Uh, I suppose one of the things that I'd kind of remind you if you're not completely fluent with this is to just, you know, pay attention to the notation and to the different types of brackets that are used to denote different things because there are really kind of subtle differences between them that can really trip us up if we are not attentive and alert to, the, to that risk. So if we write like the list one, two, three, four, five, separated by commas and surrounded by these curly brackets, that means the set of elements, the set whose elements are one, two, three, four, five. That's definitely a finite set. Its elements are one, two, three, four, and five, and there are five of them. So that's, you know, the, the task of listing the elements of that set ends after five steps. We can do it, we can do it in a couple of seconds. Okay, that's a finite set. The, and here, this is what I mean by kind of being really careful about notation, because these things look quite similar, but the differences in how they're represented is subtle but critical. So the interval one comma three, enclosed in square brackets like that, that means the set of all real numbers between one and three, including one and three themselves. Okay, so whereas if you wrote the same thing, one, three, with curly brackets around us like that, that means the set whose elements are one and three. Just, it, it only has two elements, so I, I don't want to sort of risk making this more confusing than I mean to by uh, embellishing it with little um, side notes, but I'll see what this means. So this thing, if you put curly brackets around it, this is the set. There's only elements are one and three. So it's a finite set that only has two elements. It's the exact same thing, one comma three, but surrounded by these curly brackets instead of the square brackets means the set whose elements are just those two things. And of course, if you put open, if you put uh, ordinary parentheses around it, that would be the open interval from one to three, which means the set of all real numbers that are strictly between one and three, not including one itself and not including three itself. And that again would be an infinite set. So I suppose the point I'm making here is that, you know, there are these three different sets, one, three with curly brackets around it. That means just the elements one and three. One, three with round brackets around it means the open interval, all real numbers from one to three, but not including the two endpoints. And the same thing with square brackets around it means the closed interval from one to three, which is the same thing, but with but including the two endpoints, one and three. And like it's even worse, of course, like this, I shouldn't mention this probably, but this last one, you know, has other meanings as well. It also means, for example, the point in the plane whose coordinates are one, three, or the ordered pair with elements one, three, but we're supposed to be able to, we're supposed to interpret the context, which of these uh, various things is meant. But in any case, when we're talking about sets, 
curly brackets, square brackets, and open brackets, or round brackets mean those three different things. OK, so in any case, the closed interval from 1 to 3 is an infinite set. OK, it consists of all the real numbers that are at least one and at most three. And if you think about them as you know, decimal expansions, any real number whose decimal expansion starts with one point or two point is in the set. There are certainly infinitely many of those. OK, so third example, set of integers, of course, is an infinite set. If you start listing off all the integers, you are uh, not going to reach a conclusion. Okay, that process will end up, will be an indefinite process. Same for the set of rational numbers. And of course, since the set of rational numbers includes the integers, we already know that it's infinite because a, a finite set can't contain an infinite set as a subset. Okay, here's a, just another word. This is just a kind of remark, I suppose, really, this, this next example. So sometimes it's possible to know whether a set is finite or infinite, or to know that a set is finite without knowing how many elements it has. So for example, if you take something like the set of real solutions to that equation, it's a quintic equation, degree five, we could say that's a finite set. And the reason for that is, well, we know from our knowledge of, of algebra and polynomial equations that every solution, every real solution of that equation corresponds to a, a linear factor of that polynomial. And there can be at most five of those. So it may not have five real solutions, but it certainly can't have more than five. So we can say for sure that's a finite set, even though we might not know immediately uh, how many elements it has. We can say that it has no more than five. So sometimes it's possible to know that a set is finite without being able to specifically count its elements. Okay, there's one last example, and then I will, I will uh, leave you alone until next week. So uh, last example, the set of prime numbers, for example, is infinite. There are infinitely many primes. And a pair of twin primes, in case anyone's interested in number theory, is a pair of primes that differ by two. So for example, three and five, 59 and 61, there are plenty of them in the, you know, in, in the 41 and 43. There are plenty of them between one and 100. But it's not known whether the set of pairs of twin primes, prime primes that differ by just two, that just have a gap of two between them and the number line, whether the set of twin primes is finite or infinite. Nobody knows whether there are infinitely many pairs of twin primes or not, and it's a major unsolved problem in number theory. So there are kind of interesting sets of integers that we still don't know whether they're finite or infinite. That's not so relevant to our work in calculus, but it's something that, uh, is relevant as opposed to a discussion about finite or at infinite sets. There are sets of integers that are defined by properties like this and where nobody has managed to figure out yet whether the sets involved are finite or infinite. And one of the famous examples there is a set of twin primes. So no one knows whether there are infinitely many twin prime pairs or not. Okay, I think I'm going to leave it there for now because we're out of time. Um, uh, our goal next week basically will continue this discussion about finite and infinite sets. I suppose the thing I'd remind you to remind yourselves of beforehand is just these various notations for, for, for sets and their notations also for the real rational and uh, integers, real rational numbers and integers. And we'll uh, next week we'll talk about how to, how to we'll talk, next week we're going to talk about how to think about the number of elements in an infinite set. Can I go up with this, please? Yes, sorry. More than that? Up more? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording there and thanks to everyone who joined us for the recording.